Friday. Happy Final Four Friday. It is 11 a.m. in Dallas, Texas. Irving, Texas, to be exact. I am Gina Miller. This is Mickey Spagnola. We are here with you for the next 60 minutes for Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour on Google+. Aren't you glad we don't have to call this from North Texas? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that is so true. There is some political correctness as it relates to where you are in Dallas, Fort yes, Worth. Yes, especially for this Final Four that's going on. And actually, if somebody asked me about that, and I said, well, it started with the Super Bowl. Because right. I said, if you remember, it wasn't the Super Bowl in Dallas or Arlington. It was the North Texas Super Bowl. So now it's your North Texas Final Four, and the teams will start practicing uh, at the stadium here in about an hour all afternoon, free practice. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go watch. I'm jealous. Now, we were actually going to try this Google Plus Hangout at AT&T Stadium, but with the NCAA taking over. Yeah, I just think that the logistics. And yeah. As, as Gina said, the NCAA Nazis would have been out there, <laughs> and they wouldn't have let us go anywhere no. we needed to go to be able to have some privacy to do this show. So we come to you live from the Cowboys television studio yep. once more. Cowboys TV studios at Valley Ranch, but we, we're giving you the stadium feel. That's right. With the stadium in the background right there. Um, we're going to talk Cowboys here for the next 60 minutes, and we want you to participate. But with the Final Four being in North Texas, Arlington specifically, Mickey, we got to talk about what's going on right now. This is basketball nirvana. If you're a basketball geek like me, all the basketball gods have descended on Dallas-Fort yes. Worth. And and speaking of geeks, I'm going to go watch practice, okay? And all it's going to be is a walkthrough practice, right. right? But I've done it before, and it's a it's a kind of cool thing, you know. The first uh, Final Four I ever went to, I covered it. It was in 1978 in St. Louis, and as a matter of fact, Kentucky was mm -hmm. playing in, in that one. They actually uh, they won it, I believe, if I remember correctly. And uh, Duke was in it, Louisville. Uh, no, not Duke. Uh, it was Louisville and Arkansas. And Notre Dame, as a matter of fact. And we were covering, I was working in Columbia, Missouri then. And I, I remember going to it, and it was like, this is really neat. And then the, the next one I got to go to just happened to be the Michael Jordan shot in the bad pass. Oh, you're kidding. In Georgetown in New Orleans. You're yeah. kidding. First wow. basketball game I ever went to that I couldn't hear the ball bounce. My seat in the Superdome wow. was the last row at the top. The top row, all the way wow. up. Could not hear... It was like soundless basketball because this was before they mic courts and everything, right, right? Right. It was 1982. Couldn't hear the ball bounce. Wow. That was the craziest thing I had ever seen. So I've been pretty fortunate. I've seen some Final Fours and they're a lot of fun. I dropped my cell phone. Excuse me. Um, this will be a very interactive broadcast, and I'll tell you how you can be a part of the broadcast in just a moment. I have to share my basketball geek story here very quickly. Wednesday night, I had my little basketball dream realized. I got the chance to emcee a panel at an event. Event benefiting Big Brothers Big Sisters of um, Big Brothers Big Sisters of America as well as the Nancy Lieberman Foundation, and I got to MC a panel with. It was amazing. I got to MC a panel with. Um, with, oh God, who all was there? Denny Crum, Del Harris, who he knows is my favorite. Denny Crum, Del Harris, uh, let me see who else is here. Denny Crum, Del Harris, Oliver Purnell, who's the DePaul coach. There's Denny Crum right there. There's Del Harris. There's Dave Odom, the former South Carolina coach and Wake Forest coach, who recruited Tim Duncan. He is now the chairman of the Maui Invitational. I oh, joked, wow. he's, he doesn't he have the best guy. job? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, Lon Kruger, the uh, reigning OU uh, o Oklahoma Sooners coach, who is the reigning Associated Press Big 12 Coach of the Year, and yes, Jim Beheim. Jim Beheim. So, Denny Crum would have been the coach at Louisville yep. when uh, I first went to the Final Four, and Lon Kruger was playing college basketball when I was actually covering it and in You're college. Kidding. He was at, uh, I believe, Kansas State, if, if I remember wow. correctly. Yeah. We go back. I could have been on that committee. <laughs> You could have seen them firsthand and live. So here we go. Let's talk a little Cowboys because we know that's exactly what so many of you want to discuss. And the cool thing is about Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour is that you can participate. Here's how you do it. And during the course of the next 60 minutes, you're going to see me looking all over the place because we are moderating your questions that you can submit to us via the Google Plus Q&A app, which is on your screen right there. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen. You'll see it pop up throughout the Google Plus broadcast. Or we can go old-fashioned. And is it funny now, Mickey, that Twitter and Vine are the old-fashioned <laughs> methods? You can tweet Mickey at Spags52 and tweet me at 
that sports girl. Look at you. School. Look at the technology here. Gene has figured out how to put up <laughs> slates and everything. Goodness gracious. We're actually going to play a little video here during the course of the next 60 minutes as well. Um, we've gotten some some comments about an interview that I did with Cowboys cornerback Mo Claiborne. We're going to hear what he had to say. We're also going to hear um, Mickey Spagnola's thoughts on how Rod Marinelli plans on incorporating Tyrone Crawford into his defense last year, as well as you got a chance to speak with Scott Linehan, the new passing game coordinator, and you can def definitively tell us how he likes to have his last name pronounced. Is it Linehan or Linehan? Well, I think it's Linehan. Yes. I, I don't think that came up, but yeah, <laughs> Linehan, I, I believe it is. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is when everybody, because like the question everybody wants to ask and uh, ask Jason Garrett, I guess, is how much authority right. will Linehan have? And uh, from talking to people around the building here, uh, to me, it sounds like he's going to have ultimate authority on this offense. Now, obviously, Linehan or Jason Garrett? Linehan. Uh, obviously, Jason Garrett's got a right of first refusal since he's the head coach. Interesting. But this is going to be different than what happened last year uh, with Bill Callahan because. Uh, you know, Jason still had a pretty good hand in what was going on, uh, but he's turning this over, my understanding is, uh, to Scott Linehan. He, it's his offense. He's bringing in his own verbiage, his own way to say things, his own plays, and uh, is going to trust him to call plays. So this tells you what Jason Garrett thinks of Scott Linehan because we're talking about a coach in the last year of his contract, and uh, needing to at least produce a winning record, it would seem. And now, suddenly, for the first time in, since 2007, when he became the team's offensive coordinator, it sounds like he's turning over all the offensive uh, play calling, uh, offensive design, game planning over to somebody else. And he's had a hand in this all this time. So uh, this is going to be interesting to watch uh, during the off-season workouts, which... Uh, uh, can begin, and I think we have the schedule now of the mm -hmm. Cowboys off-season workouts, uh, but uh, how things will operate out on the field, because if you remember last year when we were keeping an eye on OTAs, you know, Bill was doing some stuff, uh, Jason was doing some stuff, Wade was doing some stuff, sending in plays, but now it sounds like it's all Scott Linehan. Interesting. So so we've, we're seeing Jason Garrett acquiesce, which is nothing new for him, acquiesce these play-calling duties, why is it Linehan that has the ultimate trust? Well, I think because he's and worked authority. with him before. As a matter of fact, uh, Scott Linehan was the guy that uh, convinced uh, Nick Saban to bring Jason Garrett to Miami when he was the offensive coordinator uh, in Miami, and they worked directly together. And let's remember that when Linehan got the head coaching job in St. Louis, he wanted to bring... Jason Garrett along with him, right? Uh, to but the Miami uh, blocked that move, uh, so he had to go. Imagine that a team blocking a <laughs> no, move that for a happen. coach to go and be an offensive coordinator right, somewhere, right? Right. right. Uh, so uh, yeah, so he's worked with them, uh, has experience with them, and I think he trusts them, and and that's the big deal here. So uh, be interesting to see how all this works out. Uh, how. Uh, Tony Romo adapts now to someone else sort of having their hand uh, in the offense. I, I keep hearing, Gina, that there's too many there, you cooks, know, in the kitchen? cooks in the kitchen, hands in the pot, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it sounds like there's one major cook here. He'll have the tall hat on. I like that. But but And I think we should dive a little bit further into cook in the kitchen talk because there is a lot of dilution of the message that can be argued when you've got Linehan saying one thing and Jason Garrett, who is obviously behind what he is wanting to do, but then there could be some fractures there, couldn't there? No, I don't think okay. so. I think because this is Jason's idea. Now, I'm not sure how the Bill Callahan thing okay. went down last year and what went on, but this was Jason's idea to bring this guy in. He knows him. He obviously trusts him. And so I think that's going to make this play calling deal a little bit more seamless than what was going on last year with the relay system from, uh, right. you know, Bill Callahan uh, to Wade Wilson to Tony Romo with Jason Garrett listening in between. And if he didn't like what was happening, it's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute now. And and so th I think this will be a more seamless operation if indeed Linehan is going to take over all the play calling and the head coach can do what a head coach would normally do is 
hey, Scott, we, we got three downs, to, four downs to pick up this first down. We're not kicking a field goal. So plan your third down play, however, but you're going for it on fourth down. Things like that. And that's n normal protocol for a head coach. So what exactly will we see in Linehan's new-ish system? Because it's not going to be a wholesale change. Not no, I don't think so. Eight. Yeah, and I think, you know, Jason obviously patterned a lot of what he had in his offense from what he learned from uh, Scott Linehan. So it won't be this dramatic change. Uh, I think you'll see the ball going down the field uh, quite a bit more. Um, and, and it'll be interesting to see how he – integrates his running game because everybody thinks well he's such a he's just a passing guy he was in Detroit well they actually ran the ball pretty well in Detroit last year I think they ranked 17th uh, in rushing yards and when he was in Minnesota they actually ran the ball pretty well in Minnesota now I but, uh, you know he had Adrian Peterson then so you should run the ball well but I don't think he's just a guy that's gonna throw the ball 50 60 times a game I think uh, he's got a pretty good concept of offense We'll see how that works out. Got a couple questions coming in from Martin Homa and Nate Trumbull. And I do want to talk about Linehan just a little bit further. But, Martin, you asked a question here. Uh, when do OTAs start? Have you heard anything about the schedule? And to plan my yearly Thanksgiving trip, Cali to Texas. I'm going to go back and show you the schedule here. Very quickly, the Cowboys off-season schedule that is coming up, uh, really kicking off just around the corner in just a couple of weeks. April 21st is when the Cowboys offseason program begins. Obviously, the NFL draft, May 8th through the 10th. The Cowboys are in heavy preparations for that. OTAs begin March 27th and run through the 29th. And then you're going to see a couple more OTA sessions, June 2nd, June 4th, and 5th. June 4th is my birthday. It's a big one for me. I hope to be in Paris that weekend, by the way. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, can, can we do this from Paris? We can. We can hook up? We can. I will get at a cafe on my I want you to uh, Eiffel Tower in the background. Mickey, I'm serious. <laughs> okay. I'm serious. We'll do it. Absolutely. OTAs. I'll give you the update on OTAs. We'll just have to hook up. I love this. I can find some Wi-Fi in Paris. Trust me. Uh, June 9th through the 12th, OTAs as well, and then June 17th through the 19th. That is the mandatory Cowboys minicamp, and I think there are a couple of questions surrounding the health of some certain players as it relates to OTAs and minicamp, particularly one of the most important players, that would be quarterback Tony Romo. Right. And then, how about one of the newest additions, Henry Melton, Henry Melton. who is recovering from exactly. ACL surgery. And, and just to clarify what the off-season uh, program uh, means is that they can come in here and have uh, instruction on their weightlifting and conditioning. So that's when uh, Mike Wojcik and his crew go to work with these guys on a uh, basically a full-time basis. They uh, get in four workouts a week, uh, and, and usually there's a little bonus at the end if you get in 40 workouts over the 10 weeks. So uh, that'll begin on the 21st, although these guys are coming in working on their own. So now, Jason Garrett, or excuse me, Jason Witten this morning. Right. These guys are already they're, in they're working in there. Out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, OTAs May 27th. Now, what's missing from that little schedule that we haven't heard is when the rookie mini camp right. uh, begins, right. and I'm guessing it's going to be the weekend after the draft. Uh, they'll bring those guys in for th then because then they can stay and continue to work out, whereas before uh, guys, there's classes or, or schools finish the semester exams, uh, they could come in at May 15th. So what was happening before with the draft earlier is these guys would come in for that rookie right. mini camp, they'd go back home and then have to come back a couple weeks later. Now it looks like with the timing uh, they'll be able to come in for the mini camp and then stay and begin their off-season conditioning. And then the OTAs, you, each team gets 10 OTAs and as you can see there, they were divided up in three, mm -hmm. three, and then four, and then that'll lead into uh, the uh, mandatory mini camp the following week. So Melton and Romo, what do you think their availability uh, I would will think, be? I would think Romo will be ready to do most everything, but they won't ask him to do hardly anything. I would think. <laughs> on right. that, on the, on, on, you know, but again, if you look at the timing of it, it's in uh, the first OTAs or what was it in May? Mm -hmm. uh, so. It was May 27th through 29th. Yep. See, by then, he's going to be, let's see, can I count on my fingers, January, February, March, April. That's almost five months removed from his surgery. He had mm -hmm. the surgery the end of December, right? So normal rehab from a microdisectomy surgery is three to four months. So that means four months is April. 
end of April. So that's going to be five months. So he's going to be pretty good to go. Now, they're not going to ask him to do everything and do a lot. The idea is be ready for train for training camp, which means you've got uh, July, June and July uh, to further uh, rehab your back. I was just reading some stuff that uh, Dr. Watkins, who's another of the uh, nationally renowned back surgeons and he was talking about how uh, you know most of the guys that he has rehabbed mostly athletes uh, in four to five months they're ready to go they're ready to go back and play and let's just use for an example he was the surgeon that did the back surgery uh, just was it last week on Tiger Woods That's right and uh, he's talking about you know Tiger coming back it's so this is this is the beginning of April and Tiger coming back playing in June so three months he thinks Tiger Woods can go back and play golf now obviously playing quarterback and playing golf is two different things Things. There's no contact, usually in golf anyway, unless you play the way I do. Uh, <laughs> Are you hitting yourself yes, over right. the head? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, or hitting from weird spots. Uh, so, again, uh, I, I know there's this big concern that Tony Romo will be ready. He will be ready. It, the majority of guys that have this surgery, it, I, as a matter of fact, when I talked to Romo, uh, after he had the surgery, he said that you couldn't believe dropping my how Excuse much me. better I feel already just yeah. right after the surgery. So, uh, you know, I, I think we can count on that. As for Henry Melton, now, when they signed him, he was about five and a half months removed right. from AL, ACL surgery. Normally eight to nine months, nine months. Before, you, before you really want to be doing football-related activity. I'm sure he'll be out there uh, running. I'm sure he can be out there doing some drills, but I bet knowing this training staff, knowing the trainers, they're not going to have them do any contact work until they get to training camp. And my guess is when they get to training camp, whatever they're doing, uh, it'll be once a day. He won't be going out there the first week and going, you know, full out twice a day for, for how many times they have two a days. Uh, so they'll be careful. Their idea is to make sure this guy is totally ready to start the beginning of the season. What you don't want is to have that guy start the season on PUP and have to miss uh, the first six weeks of the season. Have you seen Henry Melton here at the ranch since you took this picture of him signing his one-year deal with the option for three more worth $24 million with uh, Cowboys personnel man Todd Williams? I haven't seen him around the ranch. I haven't, e I haven't either, so I'm not sure... Uh, he could be one of these early morning uh, rehab right. guys. Right. You never know. A lot of these guys, they got nothing else to do. They're in at 7 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, and by 10 and 11, they're gone. Uh, there's no need for us to be here that early, <laughs> by the way. So, no, but I have not seen him uh, again. And I've seen, uh, I believe I've seen uh, McLean and Mincy, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. other two defensive line uh, free agent, lineman free agents they signed. I've seen them in their uh, working out, but I haven't seen Melton since uh, we took that picture of him signing his uh, contract uh, March 19th. 19th. I was going to say one week after the start of free agency. Time flies, and it certainly does when you're having fun. Uh, you are watching Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour, the most interactive Cowboys hangout on the internet. You can participate in the conversation by tweeting us at spags52 or sending us your questions via the Google Plus Hangout Q&A app that you have right there on your screen if you're watching us here on Google Plus. Plus, I am at that sports girl as well. Uh, since we're talking defense and Henry Melton, this is a question that I know we get all the time. People want to know about one Tyrone Crawford who missed the entire season last year after he blew out his Achilles tendon on the first day of training camp in Oxnard. You had the chance to talk to Rod Marinelli about how Crawford will be used as he is taking over the defensive coordinator duties this year. I had a chance to speak with Crawford a couple weeks ago for a story that we produced for the Blitz which will air this Sunday night on all of the Dallas Cowboys television station affiliates so check your local listings in Dallas Fort Worth. It will air on Sunday night around, oh, 11 p.m. Or but, so. Or so. <laughs> yes. Depending on how late the golf tournaments go. Golf right. pushes uh, newscasts later into the evening. That's how long Babe has to continue talking. <laughs> <laughs> he said that, not me. But um, I know a lot of people want to know because yeah. they feel like Tyrone Crawford missed a vital year, his second year in the NFL. What does Marinelli plan on doing with him this season? Well, the, the big thing is, as Rod Marinelli said, I haven't forgotten about him. I think a lot of other people have. 
I think people have just uh, they they don't have they don't you know this this whole defensive line thing. Oh, they need this and this and this, and they don't take into account that Tyrone Crawford last year, uh, when when he came off his rookie season, that last month of his rookie season, he was starting to come on. He was starting to show up on plays. You could see this kid had something. Third round pick as a rookie. Mm -hmm. uh, they had big plans for him going into OTAs, and as Rod Marinelli told me, he said, boy, this guy was just playing so well in OTAs. He goes, we couldn't wait to get to training camp and to figure out where are we going to use him. And as Gina said, unfortunately, uh, the first practice of training camp, one of the first drills, it wasn't even contact. They weren't even in pads, and he blows out his Achilles. This was a the first of many significant blows on their defensive right, line because right. they had plans for him. They felt like he could take up this position, that position. So uh, I'm sure you've talked to him about his rehab mm -hmm. when you discussed it. And from everything I've heard, it's gone great. He's running out there. He's moving well. Um, and, and they can't wait to get to OTAs because they feel like he'll be ready to participate in OTAs. And when you ask anybody about him, the first thing that comes out of his word, out of their mouth, is versatility. Mm -hmm, that he mm -hmm. can play several positions. So I asked Rod. I said, "What well, do you look at him? Do you look at him as a defensive tackle? Do you look at him as a defensive end?" Right. And he told me, he "Goes well, uh, strong side defensive end for sure. Uh, we feel like he's got position flex where he can move inside and rush uh, on the nickel as a defensive tackle. They feel like if they need, if Melton's not ready." that he's a possibility to play the under tackle, the three technique tackle uh, that Jason Hatcher played uh, this past year. And in a pinch, if he needed to, I don't see this much, but to go outside on the weak side defensive end spot, rush the quarterback there too. So he's Mr. Versatility. Uh, I've called him the X factor because the Cowboys, whatever right. they don't do in free agency or the draft or can't get done in the draft, Tyrone Crawford's going to fill in. Uh, at wherever they need him, and I think he, he just, he's just he got something to him, and I think people have just forgotten about him. I saw somebody uh, come out with a projection on this is what the Cowboys' defensive starting front four would look like now. He wasn't even included. Right. They had like right. Frank Curse in there, and it's like, are you kidding me? Tyrone Crawford, keep an eye on him. As a matter of fact, I'll have a column on him on DallasCowboys.com uh, Friday evening. Tonight. 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 Yes. I like that. Time is flying this yes, week. Yes, absolutely. Um, it I, is Friday already. Is, isn't it? Mickey's already seeing the barn door. He's heading to AT&T Stadium. Right. I did have the chance to speak with Tyrone Crawford for a story that I'm doing, like I said, for the Blitz this Sunday night. And he told me what his schedule has been like for about, oh, I guess almost the past 10 months. Rehab and watch film. Rehab, watch film. Maybe get a massage, get a chiropractic adjustment, but then rehab and watch film. Now, actually, he's up in his hometown of Windsor, Ontario, Canada, running a football camp right now, but he has been watching film all day, all night. He's been watching it on his iPad. Cowboys coaches give him all this film that he can take home on his iPad, and he told me that he feels better than he's ever felt as a professional. Now, where he plays, Mickey, is going to determine his weight. Right. Um, he's going to be between 275 and 285 pounds. He's a little bit heavier right now, uh, playing off the heavier side, about 285. He's going to have to lose some weight or gain some weight or stay at that 285, depending on where he plays in Rod Marinelli's scheme. But he expects kind of being rotated in on the defensive line. No, absolutely. And, and I think the Cowboys feel like after – kind of playing with his weight his rookie year because when he when he got here they looked at him as a uh, defensive end in the 3-4 you know he was playing defensive end in a 4-3 in college so he's a little lighter so he started putting on weight and he did get up to about 295 uh, when the kind of got into the first month of the season and uh, and he said he felt a little sluggish. And right. as the season goes on, guys have trouble keeping their weight on. And he kind of lost some. And last year, I remember in the off season interviewing him, and he said, you know what, I'm going to be right at 280. I feel better at 280. They look at his normal weight at about 280. 
as Gina said, if he needs to go in and play the nose tackle position, mm -hmm. he can mm -hmm. put on five pounds, ten pounds, you would never notice it. And if he needs to play the defensive end position, maybe he takes off five pounds and plays at 275. So, yeah, she's absolutely right, and that's what Rod Marinelli told me. They like that kind of 280 range. I was talking to Leon Led about him, and, and Leon just big smile when, when, he, when you mentioned uh, Tyrone Crawford's name. And even the guys in the scouting department, uh, they can't wait to see this guy. Remember, he was a third-round draft choice, right. and they thought a whole lot of him. So, uh, you know, Red shirt year last year uh, probably comes back stronger, uh, having a whole year to rehab. And uh, you know, if if history uh, repeats itself, remember Barry Church tore his Achilles three right. games in uh, to the 2012 season, rehabbed that thing, was ready to go in the off season, and earned the starting job this past year. A little bit later in the show, you'll hear from Mo Claiborne about one of the questions he is so sick and tired of being asked. And you'll also get his assessment of his first two seasons in the NFL. Let's answer some questions here, Mickey, that we have gotten from one of our very loyal viewers. Nate Trumbull, we always appreciate you tweeting us. We see your tweets, and we notice that you are joining us each and every week on our Dallas Cowboys Google Plus Hangouts. Um, Nate wants to know, Mickey, of the second-round defensive ends in this draft, who do you think has the best natural bend to be a weak side rusher? I see a lot natural of guys bend. maybe better suited. For the strong side. And and that's Super kind of the him. problem with this draft because you're exactly right. Most of these guys are suited for the strong side, and the Cowboys have enough strong side guys. We can start with right. Tyrone Crawford. Right. He, if he had to play defensive end, he's a strong side. They signed Jerome Mincy. He's probably a strong side defensive end. Uh, George Selby, who's played uh, last year on the strong side, is a strong side uh, defensive end. And if I remember correctly, uh, last year a little bit, you know, they played, uh, if they brought back Anthony Spencer, now he was on the strong side, could he play the weak side if they indeed sign him? So they have enough weak side guys, I mean strong side guys, what they need to find is a replacement for DeMarcus Ware, and I don't see that guy around here uh, right now. And the unfortunate thing in the draft is there's really not that many first round defensive ends that are weak side defensive end, pass rushers, uh, DeMarcus Ware type, Simeon Rice type, guys that are just going to go after the There are those guys in, in many for drafts. The, <laughs> except for the first guy, right? Uh, Jadavian Clowney. Clowney, who had a pretty good workout this week at South Carolina. And I know I've got these uh, questions on, on my Twitter account about, okay, I'm just dreaming, but can the Cowboys move up to get him? And I said, unfortunately, you're dreaming because uh, if he's not the first pick, he's probably the second mm -hmm. pick. And if he's mm -hmm. not the second pick, he's probably the third pick. And you'd have to give up way too much to move up for him. After that, most of the defensive ends later are, he's right, strong side guys. And that kind of scares you. So what you start looking at, and I don't know if I can throw any names out at you, uh, but you start looking at guys that maybe people think are outside linebackers uh, in a 3-4, uh, the guy Barr. Uh, uh, there's a linebacker at Stanford. But I don't know if those guys can stand up on the weak side and play the run in a 4-3. Uh, so, yeah, this is going to be a difficult one for them to find somebody uh, that has – uh, kind of the characteristics of a pass rushing uh, defensive end. And that's unfortunate. You need one, and there's not that many available. If you remember back when the Cowboys needed one before, when they switched to the 3 4, getting a pass rusher on the outside at that outside linebacker spot, there was a couple guys. As a matter of fact, uh, Demarcus Ware was there, Trent Cole was there. Uh, help me with the guy that went to San Diego that went the next pick after. Oh, 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 uh, oh, oh. Uh, Sean, 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 Sean Merriman. Merriman. I want to say Sean, Sean Marion. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I love was, Sean Merriman. And he, he was even that. more of a strong side <laughs> Sean guy. Merriman, yeah. He was more of a strong side than a weak side. But there was there were guys. Right. Uh, unfortunately, this time they don't. There's not a lot of those guys that are first, uh, maybe second, third round. You find a guy, uh, but how good that guy is going to be, you just don't know. That's why I don't think they've eliminated the idea of re-signing Anthony Spencer providing his knee comes around and he can continue to play football, which I don't think has been determined yet. Okay, since we're talking about the NFL draft here, and we're getting a question about the draft. Thank you, Nate, for your question. You know how much we appreciate it. I want to give you um, a little bit of news regarding the Dallas Cowboys and what they're going to be doing to help you celebrate the draft. You want to party? 
Here's your chance to party with the Dallas Cowboys at the 2014 Dallas Cowboys Draft Party. It will be May 8th at AT&T Stadium. Free parking and admission. It's not often you can say that as That's it relates right. to visiting the stadium. Parking lots open at 3. The doors open at 4. You can tour the field at AT&T Stadium. Do anything else you want to do down there on the field. You can... Let the kids play and run in the play 60 zone. You can go have some beer. Mom and dad can enjoy a cocktail. The kids can run around in the play 60 zone and be just fine. You can also watch live NFL draft coverage. There will be former and current Dallas Cowboys players there that you can meet and from whom you can get autographs. You can also get autographs from Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders and get your picture taken with the Lombardi Trophy. Going to be a fun night. Um, we're going to be doing some live television broadcasts That's right. on draft we're night We're taking well. Mickey and Miller to television. <laughs> <laughs> we're taking the show and we're bumping it up a notch. Hey, I'm excited about that. And actually, our broadcast, we're going to do some 15-minute broadcasts that will air on each of the Dallas Cowboys television affiliates. We're basically going to be summarizing up the Dallas Cowboys, um, and what has happened on draft day, the first two days of the draft. And we hope when we do the first one, they've already drafted. Oh, right my gosh. Because it'll be close, yeah, right? Yeah, it will. It'll be right at the line. what are we doing, 9.30, 9.45? 9.45, I okay. believe, is our first broadcast. Draft probably starts at 7. Yeah. Our first broadcast is at 9.45 for our affiliate in San Antonio, and our next broadcast will be at 10.30. 10.30. So 10.30, we might have a pick. 9.45, we might be talking about what might the Cowboys do? <laughs> And you never know, and it's always fun speculating, and NFL Draft Night is always a lot of fun. I might have a cocktail with me. It might even become a little bit more yes, fun. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> As the night progresses, you are watching Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour, the most interactive Dallas Cowboys coverage on the Internet. I am Gina Miller along with Mickey Spagnola. We're halfway into the show today, and we're ramping up because we're going to hear from Cowboys cornerback Mo Claiborne. And, Mickey, I did a story with Mo Claiborne uh about three weeks ago, for the Blitz and for some work that I do online. And he was moving into his new house, uh, not too far here, from both Valley Ranch and from the Cowboys' future home in Frisco. It's sort of equidistant, really. Did, did you help him hang those drapes? I did. Oh, no, we took down the drapes. And trust me, he had these drapes from 1987, so you know they were a total interior decorator's nightmare. And they were bolted in to the window. We literally are sitting there with drills trying to get these screws. Like the house he moved into? Yes, because they were so the ugly. The people left the stuff The people behind. left the stuff They didn't even behind. want them. They no, were that bad. they were that bad. It was an older couple. Right. You know, they, they were stylish in the 80s. I'll right. put it that way. So we're sitting here trying to get these drapes out of the ceiling and our arms. Both of us, we think we're in pretty good shape here. Mo's working out five, seven days a week. I work out five, six days a week. We're dying. We're absolutely dying <laughs> trying to take out these ugly, god-awful bolts of fabric from his windows. Anyway, um, he's a guy. He gets it. He's a smart young man, despite the four on his Wonderlick test coming out of LSU. I think he's a smart young man, Mickey. He knows the criticism, and he knows the knock against him. He told me flat out, and you're going to see this story in just a moment. He told me flat out, I am that guy that the Cowboys traded up to get. I am going to be that guy. I'm going to be an anchor on this defense for years to come. And um, he knows it. He gets it. Now he just has to do it, which right. is easier said than done. And, 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 and the big thing for him, he has to stay healthy. Right. He, he has not been healthy here for a stretch of three months in a mm -hmm. row uh, since he arrived. As a matter of fact, he arrived and he was having surgery on his wrist, right? Hey, wrist, that's wrist, right, and remember? he wasn't able to participate and he in OTAs. Wasn't, no, to, no right. OTAs, and then he got in the training camp. Uh, if I remember, he, he either pulled a hamstring or twisted an ankle and the, or a knee, and he missed some time, and he got in the season, he got banged up, and then it happened again, this last training camp, and then the first game of the season, he basically separates a suffers a dislocated shoulder, had to play the entire season with a harness on that shoulder, and the shoulder was bad enough that as soon as the season was over, within a couple weeks, he had surgery uh, to repair a labrum tear uh, in that soldier, uh, shoulder, and he had finger surgery. So he mm. had dual surgery, That two things he had to play through. So the big thing for Morris Claiborne is he's got to stay healthy, got to be able to get through the off-season training camp and you know, the three or four months of the season without suffering a serious injury. Okay, so we are going to hear from Mo Claiborne in his own words. Like I said, I had the chance to go visit with Mo at his 
brand new home. Literally, he closed on the home on Friday. I was in the house, I believe, the following Wednesday. So here is up. Let me let me do a little bit of housekeeping here because you know all this. All so these. So you were the first guest. Maybe. I was the first guest. <laughs> I was the first guest at the new home. Uh, you know what I hate about the internet now? I'm going to sound like an old woman here. I hate that everything auto plays. Do you know what I mean? Yes, you pull it just up, starts. It just starts. You yeah. pull up ESPN and you have some commercial with George Clooney, which I don't necessarily mind commercials with George Clooney. You have some commercial with George Clooney playing. So here we go. Here is Dallas Cowboys cornerback Mo Claiborne in a story that I did for the Blitz. Moving in. No fun at all. You can make the case that Cowboys cornerback Morris Claiborne is having a working offseason. From moving into his new home, to spending five days a week in the Cowboys training room rehabbing his surgically repaired left shoulder. Ooh, I think I'm out of work. Claiborne is staying busy, focusing on what he hopes will pay dividends in the long run. That includes taking down window dressing. No fun and committing to making his third NFL season the best of what has admittedly been a disappointing career. I feel like I had the, the best two years where I thought I was going to come in and have, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm going to tear it up, you know, I'm going to do this, and, you know, that wasn't the case. Claiborne's first two years have been saddled with injuries. He missed six games last season because of a hamstring injury and lost his starting job to Orlando Scandrick. They will play fake and throw a slant, and Claiborne broke it up and got flagged for interference. And the Chiefs will hold the ball. He has 81 tackles, two interceptions, and 13 pass deflections in 25 games, far below the expectations many have for the number six overall pick the Cowboys traded up to select in 2012. Perhaps more importantly, though, it's far below his expectation, and that's something he's vowing to change. The last two years haven't been the best two, the best years for me. I'm that guy that they traded up to. I'm still that guy, you know, and I plan on showing that this season. That's one reason for the new house. I'm going to use this area. It's going to be my workout space. Um, put a couple of um, treadmills and okay. benches and That's stuff true. in there. Claiborne is committed to making a home in North Texas so he can be close to the Cowboys headquarters and be in a position to succeed going forward. Before it's all said and done, I plan on being the best corner in the NFL. You know, I just want to get better in all aspects of life. And that commitment to be the best starts at home. Thanks so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. The home he hopes to make in Dallas for years to come. For the Blitz, I'm Gina Miller. Okay, so that was the story we did with Cowboys quarterback Mo Claiborne on the Blitz. And you saw right there, Mickey, he knows exactly what each and every one of you were thinking. And he knows that when he Googles his name, Mo Claiborne bus right. is, is pretty much the first autocomplete that Google does when you're searching for him. He gets it. He knows the knock and he knows the criticism. And I think his commitment um, here in the weight room, but I think almost his commitment to buy that home is also symbolic. He could have gone back to New Orleans, could have gone back to Louisiana where he actually wanted to purchase a home and, and be in his home state. But he understands the importance of being near the ranch and the Cowboys' future home in Frisco. All year round. Right. He understands the importance of being a part of this team. And, and not just from a, hey, being in the weight room standpoint, but he's coming to a point in his career where he kind of needs to start setting an example. And if he's going to be an anchor of this defense, if he's going to help this secondary and this defense not be the worst defense in the NFL, he needs to set examples both on and off the field. And he's willing to do that. He's willing to do the work. He wants to be one of the elite corners in the league. Now it's just up to him to actually do it. And like you said earlier, Mickey, Stay healthy. Stay healthy first. Uh, the good thing buying a house here instead of uh, back in Louisiana is he'll show up uh, on weight. Yes. He won't be overweight. <laughs> he I looks good. 350 He's... pounds if oh, I lived in Louisiana. I'll tell you. He looks good. He looks. He almost looks yeah. skinny to me. So, he, and here's the deal. I My understanding is, uh, and I don't know if this is Rod Marinelli's idea as the new defensive coordinator taking over the defense or if it was kind of a staff uh, kind of idea, but they want their corners to play more man defense. Uh, Morris Claiborne, that's what he does. That's what he did at LSU. That's what I saw when he played college games, and I got to watch him play several times uh, in person. He's a man-to-man -man corner, and I thought too many times 
uh, over the last this last year, he got lost trying to play zone. And I think what happens when you play zone, and this is a little bit of a, an aside we've been doing on that same Blitz show that uh, Gina just showed you that interview from. We've been doing a coach's clinic, so we've been getting a Cowboys uh, assistant coach to go out on the field and actually show guys drills that they would use uh, for their own guys. And Jerome Henderson was out there uh, showing us uh, technique to play man, and then he showed us technique to play zone. And when he showed me technique to play zone on how you kind of start on the line of scrimmage, you, you want to make sure you reroute the guy inside and then just kind of flank to the outside, cover the sideline, and then trust that your guy's in the middle when the guy, you funnel him inside, pick him up. And I'm, and I'm sitting there watching this stuff, and I'm going, you know, Jerome, if I was playing this, I think I'd like man because <laughs> if I play zone and it looks like I'm covering the guy, but I'm really not covering him, and my buddy's inside, the safety or the linebacker doesn't pick him up, I'm the one that gets blamed for this guy being right, open. Right. I go, I don't want anything to do with that zone, and he laughed. And uh, but I got the feeling that they're going to play some more man defense, a little bit more than they did uh, this last year. I think that suits Morris Claiborne well. You just say, hey, that's your guy, cover him. I think the same thing for Brandon Kyer on the other side. That's your guy, cover him. Let's not worry about zone uh, because, again, when you release the guy inside and no one picks him up, and then you see him catch a ball and you're running after him, who does it look like got beat? Me. Right. And uh, so I think it'll help his game playing more man defense. Okay, one more thing with Mo Claiborne, and then, oops, hold on one second here. We're going to do one more thing with Mo Claiborne before we move on here on Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour. Thanks for logging on for another Dallas Cowboys Twitter view. Gina Miller here with Cowboys cornerback Mo Claiborne in his brand new house, which you literally just closed on last Friday. Just closed on last Friday, and I'm very excited about it. You are, and he's actually very nice to let us in because <laughs> you're doing a lot of work. We helped you with the furniture delivery yes, <laughs> just a second ago. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of work. You know, I'm up for the challenge. You know, I have a little time on my hand before um, we really get back to work. So I'm just enjoying the time off and, you know, hopefully get this house up and running. And let's be clear, uh, Morris's schedule is basically go to the ranch, rehab, and then come home and clean up. That's it. That's it from 9 till 4. Okay. Well, are you ready? Because I opened the floor to people on Twitter, and they sent me a couple of good questions. You ready for this? Yes, ma'am. Okay, here we go. First one wants to know basically how you're rehabbing. Kenneth Grant at KenJizzle83 asks, how are you feeling mentally and physically during the offseason so far? Oh, I'm feeling, I'm feeling great. Um, I feel like my mind is getting stronger as well as my body and, you know, just rehabbing every day and just trying to get stronger. Um, I'll be ready for when we start up um, um, our workouts and on from OTAs to minicamp. Now, I chose to shoot this interview right in front of your LSU jersey for a reason because at Knitwit4, excuse me, Knit. Twit for wants to know what if at Mo Claiborne at Real Peterson twenty one and at Matthew Era were all together on the same Dallas Cowboys D hashtag Cowboys Nation. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's some talent, right? Um, especially in those two guys there. Um, you know, if that was to happen, you know, it was to happen. But you know, right now, you know, I feel like we got all the tangibles and players we need in place you know, to, to, to go fight for that um that Super Bowl. Well, you know, having those guys on the team wouldn't hurt. No, they certainly wouldn't <laughs> hurt. Lots of talent that was listed right there. Now, I know you're a guy who gets interviewed a ton, but I would like to know what's one question that you are so sick and tired of being asked, whether it be from people on Twitter or from people like me? Uh, well, from that aspect, um, just getting – or get tired of getting asked, and, you know, you, they move down to get you, and you're this, you're a bus, you're that. You know, I get tired of, get, get tired of that question. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about um, being – how do you feel about the Cowboys moving up to get you, and you didn't do this, and what are you going to do, and that, that type of stuff? But you're a smart man. You recognize that, and I should say I asked him that question in our interview a second ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're a smart guy to recognize that, though. What's something that we would be really surprised to know about you? Uh, I, got, I, I can I can play a little basketball. Um, a lot of the guys, especially on the team, they don't they they haven't they never saw me play. Uh, well, they they think I can't play, but I, I got a got a hidden talent. You a point guard? 
I can play it all. Oh, I like that. Bold, bold <laughs> proclamation there. I like it. So you could take Tony Romo, because we hear a lot about Tony playing basketball. Right. I, I, I hear Tony is pretty good, but, you know, I feel like I'm pretty good as well, and, you know, I feel like I could take him. All right, Mo Claiborne, where can people find you on Twitter? I'm at Mo Claiborne. Thank you very much. Thanks for checking us out. We'll see you next time for another Cowboys Twitter view. So very nice, Gina. Thank you. Look at you. Got that on the air. Got all the questions in. And Somehow. You, and you have reached the maturity that he called you ma'am at least twice. Can I tell you, I hate when people call me ma'am. I absolutely hate that. I just tell people, please, call me girl. Call me chick. You can even call me that sports girl or beast, what Oakland Raiders fans called me on their sideline whenever I would patrol right. those. But don't call me man. It makes me feel old. I remember anyway. when I did the first interview with Des Bryant after he got drafted, and it was about a five-minute interview, and he must have called me sir ten times, and I was about to say one more sir, <laughs> and we're ending this interview. Right. It's like, no. <laughs> no, we're not going to end it. But we do appreciate their manners. Nice that was manners. good. No, that, that was a, a good interview, and I, he does understand <laughs> Uh, and, um, and, and, and that's good. Uh, but again, I, I just think that you got to give the kid a chance because as you see, he's pretty serious about he uh, what he's doing. And he knows exactly what you're thinking out there. Yeah. He wants to prove you wrong. Got a couple questions here we want to get to before we wrap up Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour. And we also, we're going to share a story with you of a Cowboys fans and a Cowboys fan rather, and some Redskins personnel colliding. Literally, we've got that story in and just a moment. Supposedly, it was an accident. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, we will get to Deshaun Jackson going to Washington as well. But I have a couple questions here. Um, we're going to start with Martin Homa once again, since we were talking defense the majority of today's show. Mickey, what are your thoughts on Bruce Carter? Can they move him to the middle and put Sean Lee on the outside? I can't imagine Carter leaving to another team and being dominant because we know his potential. Yeah, I don't see them moving him inside because I think one of the things that you have to be when you play middle linebacker is you have to be awfully instinctive. And I don't know that he's got that quick twitch instinctiveness about him to play inside. That was his problem outside. Uh I'm not sure what the, you know. There's talk about maybe they move him to the to the strong side, um, you know, it, depending on what they do in the draft. But I just want to. I don't know if if it took them a whole year to figure this out. Um, I'm always hesitant about making rash decisions on guys and start moving them around because I remember uh, I learned this lesson back uh, in the late '80s with Ken Norton Jr. Uh, he was a second-round draft choice of the Dallas Cowboys, and his first couple years of the Cowboys, he, he was just, he, he just wasn't very good, and he couldn't stay healthy. And I'm sitting there, you know, I'm just railing on the guy. And then all of a sudden, about 1990, 91, three, four years in with the Cowboys, it suddenly clicked, and, and, and within a couple years, he became a Pro Bowl linebacker. So, Again, and I understand in this microwave society that everything's got to be now, quick, and you can't wait on a guy to develop. You know, he was playing a different position last year that he hadn't played, and uh, he did struggle, I admit it. And uh, he's going to have to show up in training camp, but I'm willing to give him training camp uh, to show me that he can be that guy that we saw him playing when he played inside on the 3-4. Just because you can play inside in a 3-4 doesn't mean you automatically can transition to a 4-3 middle linebacker because you got a whole lot more space to be responsible for when you're in the middle of a 4-3. Well, thank you, Martin, for your question. I know Martin always joins us uh, almost each and every week here, so thank you, Martin. And one here from Mike Moreland, who both tweeted you at SPAGS52 and used the Google Plus Q&A app. We appreciate you joining us as well. Mark, Mike, Thank you for joining. Hello. So weren't the Redskins in the same boat we were when it came to cap issues? How are they signing free agents the way they are? I'm sure one of the people he is referring to is Deshaun Jackson, as well as former Cowboy Jason Hatcher. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure. You know, they they weren't they were in trouble the previous two years because of the fine they had to uh, suffer uh, that the Cowboys did, and theirs was much more. But again, you know, they had to get their cap to... Uh, they were missing, what, $15 million, $20 million a year there for two years. So I would imagine there was some space after that fine uh, had finally uh, been assessed, and they got past that. So they had some more room uh, against the cap. Now, again, 
what they're doing with a lot of these guys is they're pushing money back. They're signing them. You know, they guaranteed, if I remember correctly, Deshaun Jackson, $16 million. So uh, you're able to spread that out. Uh, they took the chance. And all I got to say is, and I said this on Talking Cowboys show on Wednesday on DallasCowboys.com, that Philadelphia gave up on a 27-year-old wide receiver who had 82 catches for 1,300 yards and nine touchdowns, and they released him. That makes me go, huh? What's going on there? Right? Huh? Yeah. Answer the question. And I don't know that it's all about the, the stories that came out on uh, NJ.com right. about his maybe possible gang-related stuff in L.A., but I guarantee you if NJ.com knew about stuff, the Philadelphia Eagles knew about stuff. These NFL teams do a pretty good job of knowing what all their guys are doing, what the background is, what's going on on the street. So uh, there was something else. I don't know if that was it. Didn't fit in. But, again, he's their best receiver. They get rid of Deshaun Jackson. Who do they have? Jeremy Macklin's coming back from right. ACL surgery. He only signed a one-year deal. So who, who's their guy? And, and they were willing to give up on the guy. So, again, that makes me go, huh? And I would have a problem guaranteeing a hung guy sixteen million dollars. Uh, and again, Jason Hatcher, they signed him to a four-year deal. But if you look at the way the contract was structured, uh, with guaranteed money, uh, it's really kind of a two-year deal. He'll get his money this year, a little bit next year, and then the last two years, if they want out, you know, they can get out and they take the dead money hit. So again. You have to be careful signing 32-year-old guys to guaranteed contracts because at some point the money is going to outperform their performance, meaning you're going to have to pay more for them what you're getting. Well, and you mentioned Deshaun Jackson going to the Washington Redskins. The thing is, you know, you Google Deshaun Jackson, which I'm doing right here, the first thing that pops up is Deshaun Jackson <laughs> gang. Okay, I'm just going to move on. I'm going to show you what he's done against the Dallas Cowboys over the course of his career because the Cowboys aren't getting a break here with Deshaun Jackson going to, um, going to Washington. He goes from one NFC, foe, NFC East foe to another. Oh, absolutely. And, and so everybody, you know, I, I hear all this, uh, you know, and see all this hair pulling, like, what are the right, Cowboys right. going to do? they got to face them twice a year. They've been facing them twice a year. And as a matter of fact, the last two years against the Cowboys, the Cowboys have managed to hold him uh, in check. Uh, he didn't hurt them these last two years like he hurt them earlier in his career. Now, I don't know. Do you blame that on the quarterback who's playing quarterback, who's not playing quarterback? Is he better off with RG3? Uh, than, than Foles, right, right. you know, I don't know, or, or, or Michael Vick. Uh, but again, uh, whatever they figured out these last two years has been much better uh, than what they were doing with them uh, previously uh, when they had to play the Eagles twice a year. Okay, and we're talking about the Washington Redskins now. Sorry, we're going to move on. Thank you, Mike, for your question. We certainly appreciate that because we're running into the clock here. Wanted to get this in before we say goodbye. Um, it's hard being a Cowboys fan in enemy territory. <laughs> Don't believe me? Look at what happened here. Uh, this man right here who is driving that beautiful Infinity, his name is Mike Elias. He's a Cowboys fan who lives in Virginia. Now, if you notice this right around here, those are three guys wearing Redskins gear, Mickey, looking at the back of Mike's car. Well, here's what happened. It's a fender bender that caused damage to Elias's car, a truck slipped out of park and hit Elias's car at Fuddruckers, just a few miles from Redskins Park in Ashburn, Virginia. Now, while the F1, F-350, rather, a car that belongs in Texas, I might say, was uh, holding a bunch of guys just going to lunch with one another, as guys tend to do going to lunch, but it all happened to be Washington Redskins groundskeepers. <laughs> so needless to say... The conspiracy theorists among the Dallas Cowboys faithful think that was, in fact, intentional. Slipped out of gear. No. Slipped out of gear. No, It just not happened at to all. hit a, Cowboys, a car with a Cowboys plate on it. Right. Huh? Isn't That's that great? Funny. Isn't that great? There you, you see the guys it. 
right there. People don't understand, and it may have been an accident. I'm sure okay? it was. I'm but sure people it was. don't understand the animosity Ugh. the animosity Redskins fans have for the Dallas Cowboys, and it doesn't match anything here. When you talk about a rivalry between those two organizations over the years, the hatred up in the Washington D.C. area with the Redskins fans for the Cowboys is much stronger than it is on the reverse side here. Uh, in the state of Texas. I'm going to show you one more picture here because if you look at it from behind, let me show you this photo real quick. This is pretty funny. Wow, how did you learn to do all this stuff? Oh, these pop-ups are killing me, Mickey. I'm not going to lie. These pop-ups are absolutely killing me here. Hold on one second. This is pretty funny. Here's another picture of the damage that was done to Mike's car, this poor guy. Something tells me he's going to get Look at that right there. Oh my. Look at that. That's a nice infinity. And you can see it not only says Cowboy Fan, but it's got the blue star right there as well. They missed the star. They just kept the light. <laughs> <laughs> when I first saw that, I thought that was right? blood on the street. Oh, there. God, no. No. <laughs> Fortunately not. No harm, no foul. Something tells me, though, that Mr. Elias might get a nice little... Um, I'm sorry or we are sorry gift from the Washington Redskins organization. My question is, will Mike take it? trash it or burn it. He's not going to take it as a good Cowboys fan, is he? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Can't do that. So one of the questions we'll get uh, before the week's out is, so are the Cowboys interested in Chris Johnson? Right. He just got released by the Tennessee uh, Titans. He's going to turn 29 this year. That's starting to get close to the end for uh, running backs. Uh, I would imagine with the Cowboys cap space, uh, they're not looking at running back as a problem uh, at this point. And, again, uh, DeMarco Murray has one more year on his contract. They like what um, Lance Dunbar, who joined us here on our hangout uh, was last, last week, week. Uh -huh. last week. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have, they still think a lot of, of Joseph Randall. They really, really like him. Okay. And so let's not just give up on a guy that you've seen play three or four times and say, oh, he can't handle it. This kid's got something. Uh, I don't see with the little bit of money – the Cowboys have under the cap that they're going to go and blow it all spending on a 29-year-old running back that, again, another team just gave up on. Uh, and I don't know that you want to sign a 29-year-old running back to a five-year deal. To me, where the game is gone in the National Football League with teams using a rotation of running backs, the last thing you want is a 30-year-old running back. I think you, you, you get one. You use them up for four or five years and then go get you another one. Put them out to pasture. And, and, yeah. Unless you think you found the next Emmett Smith or Adrian Peterson, I think running backs are becoming a dime a dozen. And they are, and they're becoming a player, like you said, a position player, like you said. Three to four years, get all you can out of them, and then manage your expectations beyond right. that. It's, really sort of, it's sort of like you know doing a lease on your car. After three or four <laughs> years, you want a new one, so you lease it, right? You don't buy it. That's good. I think you lease running backs in the National Football League these days. Unless you get an Emmett Smith yes. or an Adrian Peterson. And, and those guys are yeah. very rare just because of the way college football has evolved and how they're playing offense. They don't rely on the running back. Not not enough teams rely on them. So the, the, the quality of them, if you look at it, you know, normally what, who's, who's the first two or three guys you take in the draft? Well, it's usually their running back, right? Who, who's the best running back this year? Probably can't even name them, right? Probably the guy from Ohio State. Uh, yeah, I mean, knock yourself out. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, but but it's not like you know there's a running back just popping off the board, and that's that's an indication of where offensive, offensive football has gone. Not only in college, but probably in high school. Also. Certainly, remember back in the day here, it was all run though. The state of, state of Texas produced a quarterback. Where you can't, you can't get a quarterback in this state. Now that's all you can find is a quarterback. Where all the running backs go? They're going to be play wide receivers. Exactly. 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 I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I'm working on the next couple weeks. This, this is, is my NFL draft, draft notebook. notebook. I'm doing all my notes in here to get ready for the 2014 NFL draft. You see, though, unfortunately, 
This thing, this thing pretty much, pretty much, pretty much means like, 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 I got a lot of stuff. You're going to get a congestion stuff instead of having it. Like, all this stuff that I hear that around and around, I should be able to put it in one note, one note. You'll learn that, learn that, Joe, Joe. You'll learn that, Joe, 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 Joe. Every single year, you draft, draft, no, he actually starts styling my notes. Notes. Gosh, gosh, all the way back, all the way back into the college, college season. Really, the end of December, beginning of January. Bill Jones starts, starts. One of the, one of the, yes, yes. I need it, I need it a lot. That's a good that's idea. A good idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I find it. Find it. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. I got a lot. I got a lot of work to do. Uh, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> this was good. Yeah. Uh, good questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From our Mike, 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 Insight from Mickey on his conversation with Cowboys passing game coordinator Scott Linehan. Uh, insight from Rod Marinelli on how he plans on using Tyrone Crawford coming up in the 2014 season, as well as Mo Claiborne and his pretty honest assessment of what he has done in his first two years in the NFL. You can re-watch this Google Plus Hangout on YouTube. It will be archived on my YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Gina L. Miller. Mickey. Now, you're off to go watch some basketball. I'm going to go watch basketball practice, and I may stay for the college all-star game afterwards. So, uh, yeah, we'll give you a report on that next week, and uh, we'll be back with uh, Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour. Make sure you tweet us questions, and as I tell everybody, Gina, don't, you know, ask anything you want. I don't care. Just don't be afraid of the answer. Okay? <laughs> I like that. That should be your mantra. Right? Don't be afraid of the answer. <laughs> don't. Fear the answer. Well, we hope you have a great weekend. If you're here in North Texas, get out and enjoy it because with the Final Four in town, there's a lot of fun stuff going on. I'm going to go take advantage of it. Mickey is as well. We hope each and every one of you have a great weekend, and we look forward to catching up with you next week.